Members, I want to declare that we are now live and remind you all that this committee meeting, fully virtual as it is, is being broadcast um, online today. So if members can, can mute themselves, I think we've got a wee bit of interference at the minute. Um, currently, we have myself, Emma Sheeran, the chair, Mike Nesbitt, the vice chair. We've got Michelle McElveen, Paula Bradshaw and Carol Nicollin and Mark H. Durkin. We don't have Christopher Stalford yet, but he may join the meeting later on. And with that, I'll turn to agenda item one, which is apologies. And we have no formal apologies for the meeting. But as I've said, Christopher Stalford isn't present at this time. So members, we can proceed now to our second item. We have got a briefing this afternoon from Dr. Robin Wilson, who has provided us with a written briefing in our table of papers. And Robin, I now want to welcome you to the meeting. Oh, brilliant. Uh, thanks very much, Emma. I appreciate the invitation. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson. So you're you're welcome to begin your briefing now. Um, how long do you want me to um, speak for, Emma? I'm flexible. As you feel comfortable. You've given us quite a concise but informative briefing, so talk for however, however long you wish. Well, I'm hoping that because I gave you the briefing in advance that um, we can quickly move to uh, questions and answers rather than me um, talking it. <clears throat> great length. Um, but I wanted to um, to start um, in what might seem like an odd place, um, but I think actually is quite illuminating in terms of our dilemma. Um, in 2009, the European Court of Human Rights ruled in a case that, which applied to Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, which was known <clears throat> as the Finchie Sadic case because one of the plaintiffs, uh, Mr. Finchie, uh, was Jewish, and the other, Mr. Sadich, uh, was a Roma. And the case which uh, they took to the European Court of Human Rights, and in which the European Court of Human Rights found in their favour <clears throat> and against the state of Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, was that um, they were discriminated against under the uh, Dayton Accords of 1995, um, which were introduced uh, to bring peace in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And um, they were discriminated against um, because as a Jew and as a Roma, they were unable to vote for any of the three members of the collective presidency in Bosnia-Herzegovina who had to be um, a, 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 a Serb, a Croat, and a so-called Bosniak or a Muslim um, person from Bosnia Herzegovina, and um, moreover, uh, that um, they would have no voice in the upper house in Bosnia Herzegovina, the House of the Peoples, um, which is meant to represent equally the three peoples who are defined as constituent peoples in the Dayton Accords. That is to say, again, the Serbs, the Croats, and the Bosniaks. That ruling from the European Court of Human Rights in favour of um, Vinci and Sadic, as I said, was made in 2009. It still has not been implemented by uh, Bosnia 12 years later, even though all members of the Council of Europe are required to implement rulings by the court. It's not a matter of discretion. And it goes to the heart of our problem uh, because um, what the Finchie Sadic case highlighted um, is, first of all, the point that's made by the uh, a political scientist Naberto Bobbio, which is that all democratic constitutions in the world have the individual as their unit, not a, a putative community. The individual citizen is the unit of a democratic constitution. For example, that in the Republic of Ireland. And um, secondly, only an individual um, can be a bearer of human rights and can take a case like Finchie, the Jew, and Sedic, the Roma, did to the European Court of Human Rights to demand that their rights be vindicated. And the difficulty that we have with the formulation in the Belfast Agreement for a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights is that it breaches both of those principles. It, it's based on the notion you can have parity of esteem between two communities, 
and that somehow that can be compatible with the Bill of Rights. And it's incompatible uh, because, first of all, you can't have a democracy based on communities. And secondly, rights must be something that an individual can claim. Um, and in that sense, I think it is worthwhile bringing in what might have seemed like an abstruse comparison from Bosnia-Herzegovina, but I think it's illuminating because undoubtedly there are people who've been opposed to a Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland because they were opposed to um, any kind of human rights uh, conventions. Uh, but there are some people who are very sympathetic to human rights um, who uh, take a different view, and that is that they find it impossible to see, and I will be one of them, they find it impossible to see how the formulation in the uh, Good Friday Agreement can actually be translated into a workable Bill of Rights. And our experience over the last um, 23 years of the non-appearance of a Bill of Rights since the Belfast Agreement, I think would tend to bear out that argument. More positively, what I do in the uh, in the paper, and, and um, I think it can, it can stand on it, so I don't need to take up any more time I'm, uh, explaining it, but what I argue in the paper is that there is an alternative approach which is compatible uh, with um, the idea that constitutions are based on individual citizenship, which is compatible with the idea that individuals are bearers of human rights. And it is the formulation which has been used by the Council of Europe in those conventions which do try to go beyond the European Convention of Human Rights, which applies to every individual in the abstract, to attach rights to individuals who feel they belong to particular communities. And the formulation that has been used by the Council of Europe in that regard, as indeed by the United Nations, is the phrase persons belonging to. And it is possible, in my view, to construct a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights, which would uh, give rights to persons belonging to uh, communities. And the simplest way to do so by far, rather than to reinvent the wheel, would be to incorporate into domestic law the two Council of Europe conventions which apply in this area, the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities and the uh, Regional and the Charter for Regional or Minority Languages. If those were incorporated into a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights, whereas now they are non-justiciable, it would be possible, as I say in the paper, for example, if a woman wanted her child to go to an Irish medium school and she felt that the Department of Education was not providing um, sufficient um, availability of Irish medium education, she could then go to Uh, to respond to that claim. Um, and um, that would, would mean that these two conventions, which the Council of Europe has prepared, um, and which exist, but are non-justiciable, um, would become justiciable in Northern Ireland. And it would be possible uh, for individuals to, if they felt aggrieved under any such provision, as it touched on their sense of cultural identity, it would be possible for them to take a case and have that case vindicated if it was a reasonable case uh, by the courts here. So that's what I'm suggesting as the way to get out of this endless um, a lack of movement on a Bill of Rights. And as I say, it was actually the proposal which was agreed in the very first consultation on a Bill of Rights in the, ident in the Cultural Identity Working Group, um, which was one of a number set up by the Northern Human Rights Commission. Um, and it was to uh, incorporate into Northern Ireland law those two Council of Europe conventions and render them justiciable in the process. So that's all I would say, Emma, rather than detain the committee any longer, I would, would rather just stop there. And then obviously people can come back with questions or criticisms or comments or whatever. Thank you very much, Dr. Wilson. Um, you've, been, you've been short and snappy there. Um, I don't want to, to to dwell too too much because you have you've you've made your views very clear in both the the written and in your oral submission there around your your views with around pitfalls of the sort of the parity of steam or uh, the two communities narrative. And I think would you agree that in in creating the outcome that the good friday agreements uh, was was targeted towards in 
you know, harmony between the two main communities, which many would argue is no longer really the reality in the North and that, you know, people have identities other than their constitutional uh, objective. Uh, w- would you agree that in the, in the universality of rights and the fact that, you know, rights, whether they be group or individual rights, should be for the benefit of, of everyone and increasing one person's rights shouldn't uh, detract from the rights of another person, that in doing that successfully and effectively, we would end up with a, with a community in which everyone felt valued and respected and th- there wasn't the um, maybe d- d- disharmony or, or conflict that, that we have seen in the past? Uh, yes, I'm absolutely. That's a very good question. Um, um, <clears throat> Those of us old enough to remember the civil rights movement, um, and I was just short of my 14th birthday when the um, um, march happened in in Derry, and um, uh, I don't think any of us who went through that were unaffected by it. And um, the key thing the civil rights movement was trying to achieve, which has often been misunderstood historically, it's often been painted as if it were in a very simple sense, a Catholic communal movement against the unionist system. Um, When actually the people who were involved in the civil rights movement um, were more people who were involved in the liberal left in Northern Ireland. Um, If they actually had a vision of anything, it was a vision of a Northern Ireland would go beyond all that. And what their hope was, was if those historic grievances which had borne down primarily on the Catholic community could be addressed, for example, discrimination, in housing and employment, gerrymandering at local government level, and the existence of the Special Powers Act with its authoritarian characteristics, etc. The hope of a lot of those people who got involved um, in the, the civil rights movement at the time, uh, people like Madge Davidson or, or uh, uh, Betty Sinclair, a lot of others at the time, their hope was we would then be able to move on to a discussion uh, where we had the left on one side, the right on the other, and people would, would either be more pro-market forces or more pro-democratic regulation, rather than being trapped in an analyst sectarian argument. Now, that's unfortunately not how it all worked out, um, but that was certainly what was in the intention of many people. And in fact, I remember interviewing um, some of the activists who were involved at that time 20 years later uh, for an article I was doing for the London Independent, and that was very much what they, they were assuming. And indeed, the last thing they expected was it would lead to decades of violence. Um, so I absolutely agree. And just to, to focus on your point about universalism, um, the whole um, idea of the Council of Europe, when it was set up in 1949, was that what was needed after the war and the experience of Nazism and all that was an acceptance that some norms were universal that you know, human beings had a right to individual dignity, which applied to every individual absolutely equally. Obviously, the fascist regime in, in Germany and Italy, um, they were each completely opposed um, to that. And, um, for example, the Holocaust and, 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 and in Germany and, and so on. Um, and that idea that um, uh, norms should apply universally was of course it of course underpins the idea of human rights which the council of europe exists to promote alongside the rule of law and democracy and yes the hope is that then people can get away from thinking of themselves in an us them opposition with some other group um, and can think of themselves all as individuals who are part of a shared society and are happy to see the same rights conferred on other people as they would expect to apply to themselves I think if we could get back, if you like, to that founding aspiration of the civil rights movement in the discussion of the Bill of Rights now, we would actually probably make a lot more progress because it's tended to get caught up in that antagonistic uh, construction, which was never the original intention. Yeah, thank you. I think some of what you've said has been touched on in, in previous contributions. I mean, we had... Um, a session with Albie Sachs where he was talking about, you know, taking the fear of rights away from what may have once been perceived as the dominant community. And, you know, they have an objection to rights because it has been pigeonholed, pigeonholed as the, yeah. you know, in our, in our circumstances, the nationalist or Republican community, whereas actually nobody has, has anything to fear from that. So, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pass now to the vice chair to Mike. 
Chair, thank you very much, Robin. Good afternoon. Thanks for engaging. My pleasure. You've been at this a while. <laughs> it did. Yeah. I didn't used to be so great hurt. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. Could I take you through that wonderful phrase, special circumstances? Well, what have you got to say on, on that issue? Well, I think the, the, the way that um, I have set out, the approach that I've set out, um, Michael, is actually very compatible with that. Um, and let me put it this way. Uh, as I said just, just now to Emma, um, the European Convention on Human Rights assumes that every individual is just an abstract individual. Um, it doesn't require you to know anything about them. Obviously, though, if you move on to these other conventions we've discussed, the Framework Convention or the, um, uh, the, the, the Charter of Regional Minority Languages, you're into quite particular things about people's sense of nationality or the, what their mother tongue is or whatever. And so the idea of these additional conventions is precisely to apply to special circumstances um, over and above what applies generally. Um, obviously, in other uh, parts of uh, the UK, for example, there isn't the same issue around Irish language education as, as there is here, which I mentioned earlier as an example. And you can pick all sorts of other examples too that are special to Northern Ireland. And but the beauty of these conventions is that um, because they use the phraseology they use, they show that it's possible to have um, conventions which apply universally uh, to everyone and are therefore non-threatening in the way that Emma's just um, argued, but also address concrete, particular, special uh, circumstances and, and requirements. Yeah, and I'm taken with the fact that you're saying we don't need to reinvent the wheel. And, and that these conventions not only exist, but serve a purpose. Yeah, yeah and also, sorry, Michael. No, I'm just thinking, you know, that, that's a kind of, as it were, a sort of top-down approach. Whereas I think we have been looking at a sort of bottom-up approach. For example, last week, the evidence we heard from were uh, an expert as a champion of people with disabilities, uh, and somebody who champions the, the transgender community. And of course, we've done a, a big public consultation, which has got quite uh, quite a significant volume of responses. How, how do those th two things go together? If you're saying there's, there's kind of off-the-shelf fixes, well, I mean, it's, it's obviously up to the the committee to decide how broad it wants the reach of a bill of rights to be, and there are. Perfectly legitimate arguments that say we want to include various social and economic rights, such as rights uh, pertaining to uh, experienced people with disabilities or people who are transgender, for example. Um, I did a focus group with um, uh, uh, people who are transgender a couple of years ago, and um, I was very struck by, by um, a lot of the really problematic experiences that they had had. Um, which could either be addressed in legislation or could go into a, a bill of rights. That would be a, a, a legitimate discussion to have in itself as to whether this kind of thing should go into a bill of rights or should be left for separate legislation. I'm only focusing specifically on the cultural identity area, and I'm conscious that that's the area that in, in, in terms of the Belfast Agreement and the debate about the Bill of Rights has proved the most contentious. I think if we can crack this one, the rest of them would be relatively easy uh, to, uh, to deal with. Um, there is, of course, another area in the Belfast Agreement which hasn't been uh, implemented, uh, like the Bill of Rights, which is the Civic Forum. I did quite a lot of work with the Civic Forum, and I was running the think tank I was then running um, when it was established, um, including drafting for it the strategy on social in regional strategy for social inclusion, which the Civic Forum recommended, and which at that time the uh, Mark Durkin, as Deputy First Minister, and um, um, his counterpart, a junior minister, whose name is on my head, and they endorsed at the time, but it, that was just before the assembly was suspended and it didn't go any further. Um, so yes, there are all sorts of other ways you could involve in a bottom-up way um, various social groups in Northern Ireland who have various legitimate social claims to make, and then it's an, a, a legitimate argument as to whether all that should go into a Bill of Rights or whether it's better to keep the Bill of Rights to a more restricted set and, and address other things legislatively. Mm. 
Yeah, in terms of the Civic Forum, I was engaged in quite extensive talks around House of Sullivan, Stormont House, on models of a Civic Forum. I, really, I regret we weren't able to agree a model or a couple of models even to take forward as pilots. Um, the other area, Robin, is, is this idea that parity of esteem is incompatible with the Bill of Rights because it's about community. So I'm thinking about the, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and you have you know, parity of, of esteem, which we might consider to be in the area of equality. You've got mutual respect, which might be more in the, the field of good relations. And, and I'm struck by something Carol said a couple of weeks ago, Carol McKillen, and she'll correct me if I misinterpreted her. But when you get those two things, equality and good relations, while good relations is highly desirable, absolutely highly high, it has to give way to equality, which is essential. And would, would that be a reasonable position to be taking? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah. I, I used to be involved uh, quite heavily in, with the Community Relations Council. I was chair of the policy committee for uh, several years. And um, yeah, this is something that was often raised where uh, there were concerns amongst those who were active in pursuit of equality here, that if one was to talk about, quote, community relations, unquote, one would end up in a scenario where one was having to soft pedal um, on equality because some people were uneasy about it. Um, one of the uh, wider um, uh, benefits, I think, of bringing to bear this Council of Europe uh, uh, framework, which I've been heavily involved in uh, developing over the last uh, two decades, what we've come to call as a shorthand intercultural integration. Um, and it's elaborated in, in, in depth in the white paper on intercultural dialogue, which the Council of Europe produced in 2008. And um, we'll translate into uh, a template for uh, intercultural integration plans for the member states, which I was one of the main drafters of, which will be agreed by the committee of ministers hopefully this year. And um, in that work, there is a seamless um, move from equality to intercultural relationships because they're actually seen as interdependent and having a synergy between them rather than being contradictory and counterposed. Um, I think it is unfortunate the way they've often been counterposed here um, because they, they do actually go together. If you have a more equal society, that's also a society where you don't have grievances that are unnecessary and which cause intercommunal tensions to emerge. Um, and equally, if you have a society where there is a commitment to the good of all, rather than a good of one community alone, then you will tend to get more consensus behind measures for equality and so on. Um, so yeah, I think we can crack that one, uh, Michael. I don't think it's, uh, it's as insuperable as it often is presented as being. No, no, I would agree, but, but I take your point that you can't prioritise good relations at the cost of soft peddling uh, on no. equality. No. Well, Robin, good to, good to speak to you. I hope, I hope we might surprise you in, uh, in the coming. Well, you've been at it for more than a fortnight, if I may use that pun. Thanks for engaging, and thank you, Chair. <laughs> Yes, but perhaps for younger readers, we ought to say that um, I used to be editor of Fortnite magazine in my pens in the 1980s and early 90s, which is what Mike's referring to. I I, I don't remember it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> don't hold that against me. <laughs> uh, I now want to pass to Carl. I don't think any other members have indicated, so if anyone else wants to ask a question, um, just let us know. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, um, Robin. Um, and I do remember Fortnite. I remember getting into bad and <laughs> But anyway, we no longer there on Wayne Tavern Street, so I wouldn't play my ball. But uh, and fair play, Mike, you didn't misquote me at all. You completely represented what I said. Um, and I also am old enough to remember you've been on the Community Relations Council and the rows that we all had around equality versus good relations. The reason that I am still passionately holding on to that is because even to this day in North Belfast, we have houses, much needed social homes being blocked on the basis of a lack of consensus and community cohesion. When if the housing executive, you know, just implemented their statutory obligation to meet equality, then it wouldn't be an issue. So sure. 
you know, you'll forgive me for my persistence in that. No, that's but, I mean, that's a perfect example, Carol. That, that, yeah. yeah, yeah, and like you, you also will know. Um, some of us here remember the Good Friday Agreement, and we're probably there. But um, like, for example, two issues that weren't in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement were the issues of reproductive rights for women and marriage equality, and yet and all, they were at the heart of you know the the suspension amongst other things for three years of the government but so i suppose emma's point is where i'd start as well it's and you agreed um it's a, the the universal approach to rights you know the for everyone but i particularly like your approach around the framework the convention for people of national minorities and the charter um as well because First of all, it means if you want to learn a language, you can. If you don't, you don't. You know, it's and it's also about recognition that there are many cultures that make up our society here and our our one community rather than two distinct ones. The question I would have, Robin, and I I think I know the answer, but I'm, I don't. I never assume anything at this age. So we don't have a single equality act, and Britain does. Um, and why the debates around the Bill of Rights has been, you know, don't include include social and economic rights and or do or keep it minimum or, or include everything. What would your own position be? Because even just that example I've give you, so in essence that was a section seventy five case, but yet and all the legislation wasn't implemented. So I guess I'm asking is do you include equality legislation in that Bill of Rights as well, particularly around this, all those issues, but social and economic rights as well? Well, I mean, certainly, um, I can't take your first point first. Uh, it is a very good example uh, because um, clearly housing has to be, a, social housing has, has to be allocated according to need, period. Um, and there's no other sensible basis on which you can allocate social housing or you can make decisions about the construction of social housing other than on a basis of, of, of social need. Um, secondly, um, it is re very reprehensible that, that um, the Equality Act was never extended to, um, to this place and obviously it could have been and one could still press for it to be extended here. Equally, it would be possible to include um, provisions that are in the Equality Act, either in legislation here or in the Bill of Rights. Um, I don't think it would really matter a great deal whether it was a legislative or a, uh, the Bill of Rights route. The substance, obviously, is what matters. When it comes to social and economic rights, um, there is a formula which I know that Bryce uh, Dixon uh, liked. Um, when you know Bryce is obviously a human rights expert, former uh, chief executive of the Human Rights Commission, um, he liked the formula, uh, which goes back to South Africa uh, uh, um, with Emma's reference there of, um, no, I'm not sure of the exact words, but it's something like progressive realization. In other words, what, what, um, what, it's, what it's doing is addressing the problem that if you want to put social and economic rights into a Bill of Rights, you can't actually say, well, there will be X level of economic growth or there will be X uh, outcome in terms of some other indicator because it's not like a civil and political right where you can say yeah you've got to do that to a public authority if someone's being denied their rights uh, but you can put a more aspirational thing into a bill of rights at least um, that says that some social and economic rights would be uh, pursued and that it would be a requirement on public authorities that they contributed to their progressive achievement um, some such uh, phraseology would be possible. Um, but then, of course, you can also address all those kinds of issues through ordinary um, legislation. And I think one of the um, the big um, uh, uh, issues that the Assembly has faced over the years, partly because of the suspensions, has been its legislative record hasn't been strong. Um, you could say, looking to Scotland, for example, they've done much more vis-a-vis -vis things like renewable energy promotion than, than, than we have done here. Um, if we had had a strong focus on renewable energy with legislation behind it, we might, for instance, not have got in the situation where the shipyard was nearly closing until the workers occupied it. Um, uh, and um, so I wouldn't put all the eggs on social and economic policy into the 
the Bill of Rights, uh, because there's a limit to what you can do within a Bill of Rights in that regard. But again, there's no reason why we couldn't have a Bill of Rights which had that general formula of progressive achievement or realisation or whatever, and then you would pursue more concrete um, uh, economic and social policies in legislation in the normal way. Sorry, I manually lost you there. I don't know what happened to my connection. No, Robin, I, fair, fair enough. I I accept what you're saying. It's just that, I mean, I, I actually have seen the, so we've had almost two different parallel processes going on here. Obviously, there's a nationalist Republican stroke loyalist unionist, but I've also seen the, the free market forces and then, uh, you know, people like myself, probably, not probably, certainly more to the left. And I, I also see a free market approach as a lack of social justice when it comes to the expectancy of a right to work and train and everything else. And when you have, you know, someone slavishly following a Tory government, then uh, that's where I, my nervousness around a lack of social and economic rights, um, it actually just gets gets worse. Um, and given and, and just given the whole uh, history of market forces, um, I mean, we've now got more depraved communities here that have been persistently deprived, and there's very little ebbing and flowing between the top ten percent. Um, and that's why I'm asking. I'm, I, you know, I, I don't want to just you know, lift a, an old handbag out and stuff as much as you can in it or a suitcase and sit on it and hopefully it closes. This is about making sure not only do people see themselves and see the vision of it, but actually it needs to have outcomes as well. So that is that is the reason I'm asking. And while, in my opinion, um, you only have to look at what happened over welfare and certainly the attacks on public services, particularly benefits for people with disabilities, which again are enshrined in legislation. It's just, it's awful, you know. So thank you, Robin. Um, and br bring back Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has come back, um, Carl. It came back yeah. for its 50th anniversary. Yeah, um, I know. And, there, and there, there have been a couple of issues since. Um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, uh, it's a bit like old rock bands kind of getting together again. <laughs> well, tell you what, if Led Zeppelin, we're playing, I would literally save up a whole holiday to go and see them. So go right. for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We have another day's discussion about music. I'm going right, to right tell people nowadays that I had the privilege of seeing Pink Floyd and uh, Bob Marley play live. Um, they just look at me in amazement. <laughs> now you're, you're just showing off now, Robin. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't remember the people you're talking about. Can I go on now? Paula has indicated that she'd like to ask a question and bring Paula in. Um, well, good afternoon, Robin. Good to see you at the committee today. Um, my issue is around some of the sort of threads that have been running through um, all of our presentations, and it's about how you feel that a preamble to a Bill of Rights would really help sort of the whole ish, um, notion of interculturalism. And then the second part is, is in relation to paragraph five of strand one of the Northern Ireland Act. And that's pretty much about that we would have to, if we were bringing forward legislation, have to reference the European Convention on Human Rights, but also a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. And I'm just wondering whether if we included socioeconomic rights, then um, that the Bill of Rights would be a great, um, sorry, I'm probably putting words in your mouth, um, a, a good pre-legislative um, scrutiny tool that would ensure that we would protect those minorities and those people who are marginalised in society. So I just wanted to see if you had any thoughts on either of those points. Um, well, yeah, hi, Paula, um, and uh, I'm glad you aren't, aren't asking me about music. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, on the first point, um, before the um, agreement appeared, I was um, in touch with a senior official in the Irish government side who was involved in the negotiations. 
um, and who um, subsequently went on to even higher things. And I said to him, I thought it would be really good if the agreement could start with a visionary preamble, because most people, when they saw the bullet points about it on their TV screens, they, they wouldn't kind of get into the detail. But if there were just a, uh, some inspiring kind of words and phrases in the beginning of it, in the preamble, that would give people a sense there was a vision uh, for a different place um, that, that they could and look forward to for their children and grandchildren, that that would have been very strong and very valuable. And the official I spoke to is a very nice guy, very sympathetic, and I said, no, we couldn't do that, Robin. And I said, why not? And he said, well, it's not a we the people document, it's the two governments. And anyway, they couldn't agree on a vision. Um, and, um, and I thought, oh, God, it's still depressing. Um, anyway, um, to come back to your point, yes. Um, again, if, if there were Northern Ireland Bill of Rights, um, very few actual citizens, unless they wanted to claim their rights, would read it in detail. But they could get a sense, and it could be something that would be used in the classroom for education purposes, they could get a sense uh, from a, a visionary preamble um, that it was holding out a vision of something different, something better that they could easily identify with and would mean something to people who weren't lawyers, um, even if there was some legalistic material in the bill itself. Um, secondly, I think, yeah, um, in terms of the relationship between what would be in a Bill of Rights and other legislation, yes, if there were um, references in a Bill of Rights, uh, for example, in the social and economic arena, um, which were agreed, and as part of the bill, then when it came to drafting concrete legislation, that could be called an aid as an argument for the kind of route that one was going down. Um, and yes, that would be perfectly feasible and sensible in my view. I'm not a lawyer, but um, it seems to make perfect sense to me. Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you. Okay, Paula, I don't think anyone else has indicated to, to ask any questions. No, uh, no one has jumped in to correct me there. So, Dr. Wilson, I, I want to thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Oh, maybe, is Mark looking in there? Yes, I'm all chair side from the, from the, from the dark side. Of the <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, pretty soon people will look at, at you in amazement if you say you've seen anyone Live, you know, it's so I can't wait to get back to, to, to those kind of events, Robin. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Robin. Just just one more thing I was going to ask, and that's maybe for your your view on the meaning of the phrase, the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland, and how, if at all, and I think they have, but how, if at all, these particular circumstances have changed since 1998. Yeah, um, thanks, uh, Mark. And it's difficult to talk to a black space, uh, but at least I know what you should look like. So I'm imagining you filling that space at the same time. Um, yeah, just to build on what I said to um, uh, to Mike, and also what Emma said herself, <clears throat> I do touch on it in the the presentation. It was partly also why I raised the point at the beginning about the Finchy Sidage case. <clears throat> Clearly, since the agreement has been promulgated. Um, what um, has always been particular to this place um, in terms of um, uh, the idea of it being um, essentially two groups of Christians um, has changed uh, quite significantly in terms of the demographics, um, both because of um, migration from elsewhere in the European Union, um, though for the moment we're not in it, and I hope that will, will change, um, and uh, because of people arriving here as asylum seekers and as, um, as refugees. And um, um, that's very important because it also connects back to what uh, Emma was saying about universalism, that um, <clears throat> it, it would be critical that um, any Bill of Rights uh, for Northern Ireland would be something that anyone here should also feel spoke to them as well as it spoke to individuals here um, who saw themselves as Catholic or Protestant or, 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 or neither. Um, and um, I think that um, the, um, the way I've set out uh, a way to proceed based on conventions which are themselves universal, though they apply um, to the particular identities individuals may um, have, I think that approach is helpful in that way because um, 
it would be applicable to the context in which we live um, today and in which we'll be living for the foreseeable future, which will only be of a more diverse society than we already experience. Okay, no, cheers for that, Robin. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And yeah, I'd like to see you face to face at some stage in the future too. Um, it's a bit odd because it sounds a bit like a kind of a, a, a someone talking from beyond the grave. But happily, you're you're completely alive and and and, and well. I trust. Keep him with the Pink Floyd theme. I <laughs> wish you were here too. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Um, well. I'll not pretend that I that I get that reference, but uh, I, oh, I just, just it's want... a Pink Floyd song, and of course, I'm sure Carol also remembers a flo a song called Money, um, which took a very dim view of market forces. Um... <laughs> Thanks very much, Dr. Wilson. I just want to thank you again for joining us this afternoon for the for your time and your your patience in answering our questions and uh, for your written submission as well. So at this point, we will let you take your ease and and thank you so much for for your contribution. Oh, my pleasure, Emma. And um, if there's anything else you want to come back with, if any of the members of the committee think of something subsequently they want to challenge me on, um, then, of course, you can contact me to do so. Of course, you may regret making that offer. <laughs> Thank you. Members, we can now move to our uh, next presentation this afternoon. So um, I know that broadcasting will be probably working out the technicalities of this. Um, so we may just have a momentary lapse. Yeah, so we can bring Yana into the, the spotlight. So members want to welcome Yana Monaghan from NIWEP to give us a presentation this afternoon. And Yana has provided a, a written briefing, which you'll find in your packs. So Yana, welcome to our meeting. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us and for your written submission. And uh, I'll let you proceed if you want to begin your briefing. Sorry, you might be muted. We can't hear you. Sorry, I should have learned by now. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Emma, and and to all members. We're really pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you today. So just for a short introduction, my name is Jonna Monaghan. I'm project coordinator of NIWEP, or Northern Ireland Women's European Platform. So the clues, clues in the name, we are... Uh, membership organization, really we were set up to act as the link between the women's sector in Northern Ireland and the European and the international level. And more and more of our work over the years has been at the international level. So we have consulted that is that is with the UN. And our core role really is to share evidence, bring women's voices from Northern Ireland to the international level and then bring back evidence, good practice and lear learning locally. And a core part of our role is representing Northern, women in Northern Ireland at the UN. And in particular, we would work with CEDA, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. They are all really long, so we'll use CEDA no, for short. We would provide, co coordinate the shadow report to, to that. And, you know, you, you can see, see where I'm go, going with this already. So our core work really is around raising awareness of the UN human rights treaties and promote implementation of them in particular CEDAW um, and we would view implementing the recommendations CEDAW as a clear roadmap from a women's perspective to how women's human rights are fully met, up, met and upheld in Northern Ireland and really today you know, we, we have two key messages in relation to this and really in all simplicity. So the UK is, is a state party to CEDAW and all core UN human rights treaties, which means that the UK and therefore Northern Ireland has obligations under international law because, law because the treaties are, are ratified. And the way we would see a Bill of Rights is to systematize these international obligations, which, which are binding. and basically put very simply these rights are already there they're not new it's just about how we put them in place in a systematic way so that rights are clear and equ equitable to everyone and again you know as a previous speaker has already said you know we think that it's really important that rights are justiciable because that's central for that them to be meaningful so that they're more than aspirational or values or anything like thing like that 
And from my perspective, the importance of Bill of Rights is creating clarity for everybody in Northern Ireland on, on rights and provide a robust framework so that everybody can see that rights are fair and equ equitable. I mean, put in plain English, really, that the, nobody's rights are being taken away just because rights for everyone are, be, are being upheld. And that's about the, the, so the fa fairness and that the rights are based on the principles of universality and equity as well. And what, where we're thinking that it's particularly important is that Bill of Rights can underpin a rights-based approach to policy, and I'll say a little bit more about, about that later. And again, we think that that's important to develop Northern Ireland in, I think we've written diverse and cohesive region, but really what we mean by that is that you know, decisions are, are made based on, on need, but in a way that, in, that on the whole, everybody's rights uh, are, up, are upheld. And as I already said, the core value is providing a basis for implementing the existing rights and addressing the barriers to effective implementation. So I know that there will be women's organizations in the weeks ahead who will give more detail on you know, exactly why a Bill of Rights is important from a women's perspective. You know, from what NIWA would like to say, to say in this context is that the core issue is lack of implementation and lack of realization of rights in a fair way. So a lot of rights are enshrined in existing law, but they're not necessarily implemented in full or in a way that means that everybody can realize those rights in full. And we think that everybody having the capacity and ability to realize rights is important. And that's where a, real, a Bill of Rights really is important. So as an example, from a women's perspective, obviously, Equality and employment le legislation prohibit discrimination relating to pregnancy and maternity, but breaches occur on an ongoing basis. So that means that women cannot enjoy those rights in full. You know, that, that's a fairly straightforward example. You know, across the board, people from disadvantaged and lower income backgrounds are less able to take part in political decision making, for for example, for a variety of reasons. And women have additional care burdens, which is an in added bur burden and barrier for them to participate uh, in public life if they so choose. So that's, an, that's another example. And again, CEDO has highlighted in issues with implementation of the right, human rights of women and girls for, for many years. So just as an example, the last time the UK was examined under CEDAW was in 2019, and the concluding observations are focused on concerns that legal protections for women and girls in Northern Ireland are falling behind those elsewhere in the UK on a number of areas, but they specifically focus on things like domestic abuse and gender-based violence. You know, at that time, coercive control legislation was outstanding. Um, we still don't have a specific strategy on violence against women and girls. And, you know, th there are other examples at, at strategy level. There's a gender strategy currently being implemented, but there's no childcare strategy and no care strategy. And the gender pay gap legislation hasn't been enacted in Northern Ireland as yet, although it has elsewhere in the UK. So th that sets out why, the context of why, why we think a Bill of Rights can, is important because it, it helps with addressing those and provides a basis for taking, taking action, both at the policy level and again at an individual level if people have feel that the, the rights haven't been upheld. But uh, the second key recommendation is really that a Bill of Rights should be based on the international human rights framework that is there. So the UN human rights treaties, there are seven that are identified as core, and I'll not go over them now, they, they will be in our, our paper. And then the European Convention of Human Rights, and another. then there's the Istanbul Convention on Violence Against Women and Girls would be another one specific from the Council of Europe. And the reason that we feel that is important is that that provides an international set of standard, standards 
and provides benchmarking. So we get Northern Ireland, you don't have to reinvent the wheel essentially, but you can also be sure that it's something that has been agreed and approved, if you like, at an international level. And several of the treaties as well provide directions for action on how rights can be realized in practice. So CEDAW emphasizes that there needs to be legislation across the board to eliminate discrimination in all spheres of life. And again, I, this came to mind when I listened to Dr. Wilson earlier. This links to progressive realization and it provides an underpinning for a rights-based approach to policy and decision making. Again, the Bill of Rights cannot and should not deal with all of it. But if, if the frameworks are in a Bill of right, Rights and incorporated in legislation in Northern Ireland, then that provides a mechanism for legislation across areas and policies and practice to take to take that into account and contribute to progressive realization. And that doesn't mean that local judgment is removed. I mean, the decision-making power still rests with the assembly on exactly how rights are balanced and to what extent implementation happens and how. And again, really, uh, almost by way of conclusion, no, I think it can't be emphasized enough that Northern Ireland is already bound by these standards because the UK as a whole has ratified the, the treaties. And we actually would be really keen to see incorporation of the treaties into domestic legislation through a Bill of Rights. And that would be, that would be similar in Scotland. This is currently happening. They are preparing to incorporate CEDAW in domestic legislation. Wales has incorporated the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and that would benchmark Northern Ireland as a leading region, not just within the UK, but internationally as well. And in Scotland, they are looking at, the, there's a number of reports from from a social neural advisory board uh, that has recommended the same for Scotland as a way to transform both design and delivery of public ser services and as a way of informing finance decisions as well. And they're expecting that there's a national task force on human rights that's going to, they expect that that's going to be the same recommendation. So really just to conclude, you know, this is a real opportunity to show leadership in this, and to, you know, from the, the assembly to create a clear basis for a rights-based approach to developing Northern Ireland in the, in the future. And it, Certainly, from a women's perspective, it's something that would significantly help. You know, I, I'm more than happy to take questions. That there are examples of how CEDO has been used, for, for example, in relation to reproductive rights. So, thank you very much. Thanks a million, Yana, um, and thanks, thanks for for your your outline there of the important issues um, from someone who, who's working within the women's sector. The, the last point that you made there is something that I want to touch upon because you referred there several times to CEDAW and that, you, that reference that you made to, to reproductive rights and how that works on the ground. And it's one of the questions I have around how we can use a Bill of Rights for an accountability measure and for sort of an insurance policy on rights. And creating uh, that sort of rights-based approach that you refer to, that attitude of rights and having people thinking of rights as something that affects them and something that they can access as apart from a, an abstract notion in the sky that doesn't mean anything to, to community and, and to, to individuals living um, in, in the real world. And CEDAW, obviously, as a convention, is something that the government that we're still uh, under the jurisdiction of have exceeded and that should be implemented in, in all of the devolved uh, administrations. But the, the reference there that you made to reproductive rights, and obviously it was through CEDAW that the UK government decriminalised abortion in the North, but we can see that even though that right is supposed to exist and is there in legislation, it's the, the outworking of that hasn't been realised because we have political decision making from a minister here who doesn't want to implement services. So I wonder how we can 
um, frame a Bill of Rights as something that ensures accountability and ensures that a minister when making a decision has to have rights as their first priority and equality and opportunity for everyone what you said there about you know universalism of, of rights and the fact that they're for the entire community how, how do we how, how do we best um, legislate for a Bill of Rights to ensure that? I think that that's exactly one of the reasons why we, we think that basing a Bill of Rights on the international frame, framework provides that, that kind of a mechanism because already from a, from a UN perspective, the UK is accountable to the, to the UN uh, or more specifically the international community. So there are, there are reports on a periodic basis for all of them, you know, for CEDA, which is the one we would be most familiar with. It's on a four, four yearly basis. And that, well, it's the Westminster as the state party, but drawing in evidence from all the development administrations as well. They have to give an account for what they have done to promote women's rights and gender equality. And they, this, there will be specific questions sometimes on, you know, on those recommendations. And obviously, in the most recent concluding observations, you know, one of the recommendations is to to implement the CEDAW inquiry under the optional protocol in full. There, you know, there are elements that haven't been started, for example, linking to relationship and sexuality education, which is something we would highlight that as critical to underpinning of all all of that debate. But so, you know, that that's an accountability mechanism is sort of built in. And then there's the, se the optional protocol provides the second account accountability me mechanism. Not all of, of the treaties have one, but several do. And they basically provide a mechanism where you can take a complaint if something isn't being done and ask for that to be investigated at the international level. And it's, it's not a court system, but it is that sort of international reputational issue and provides you know, provides a way to give strength in to to the recommendations so again CEDO is an example of that and i think you know again the example of, of how it has been used shows that local decision making isn't being taken away you know it's not about the uk being taken to court but you know, certainly, you know, you know, the, it can strengthen the argument and, and it can provide reassurance for individuals at level of individual people that this is not just, you know, words on a page. So you would agree then that a Bill of Rights should be there as a framework, a template that ministers have to align themselves to? if if. If we're looking at, a, at a, a Bill of Rights in terms of the Good Friday Agreement, uh, the, the commitment was that the, the British government should be legislating for a Bill of Rights. Do you think that's important to ensure that it is that, that it has that accountability factor? I think there's many, many ways of achieving for a Bill of Rights, but certainly, you know, when we talk about the rights-based approach, we think it's absolutely essential that a Bill of Rights is something that ministers would have to take account of when passing legislation or developing policies, you know, that to us is the, you know, is the fundamental value of a Bill of Rights. Thank you, Yona. I'm now going to pass to the Vice Chair and then I've got Carol and Paula. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. Yona, hi. Um, I, I just declare to begin with, um, I work with Yona on the APR Party Group on UNSCR 1325, Women, Peace and Security, so kind of familiar with, with CEDAW. Um, there's really just one area, you know, um, we've been told pretty consistently that uh, with regard to the progressive realization of, of social and economic rights, that you would not be able to go to court and challenge the executive about their budget allocations. You couldn't go and say, they haven't given enough money to the housing minister, they've given too much to the education minister. You could only go and say, 
the housing minister, we believe, uh, has misallocated his budget, you know, perhaps because he's, he's showing tendencies to be sectarian in his preferences. What, what I'm wondering is, could we put gender budgeting into a Bill of Rights? Because at the moment, uh, as you know, we're, we're very weak on looking at the gender budgeting impact of, of the budget. So to take, for example, sport, we know what the department gives to Sport NI, we know what Sport NI gives to governing bodies, but we don't know the gender impact of how the governing bodies spend the money. Yes, if, if, you know, if the Ulster Council have a specific program to promote women's Gaelic football, we know what they spend on that. The Ulster Council, or so the Ulster branch of the, the, the rugby union can tell us if they've spent money on a specific program to promote women's rugby, and the same with soccer. But overall, they don't know. Could we put that sort of requirement to monitor the impact of gender budgeting and to ensure its progressive realisation into a Bill of Rights, do you think? I think, you know, obviously it would be for the Assembly to decide exactly what should go into a Bill of Rights, but certainly gender budgeting definitely fits fits with the Bill of Rights and it would be a logical tool for implementing it it a potentially a helpful tool in the sense that if you have a bill of, of rights in place you will need exact you will need tools to find out have budget allocations been made in, in line, line with it and that's where budget agenda budgeting comes in because you know i think it's worth under underlining that it's not a tool for for channeling additional resources to women. It's about looking at the impact of uh, budget allocations. And that's exactly the sort of tool that, that you would need to be using so that you can prove that your decision making and your budget allocations are in line with a Bill, bill of Rights. And critical as part of that is that you would need significantly strength of data collection because we have, we have very limited breakdowns of data on a number of grounds, you know, certainly on a gender basis, it's even more difficult, obviously, to get data on disability and minorities and so on. But, so I think in a in natural gender budget, it would definitely be something that you would expect to see as part of progressive realization. Mm. Yeah, I appreciate that, Fiona. Just I think it's more of an observation, particularly for the chair, maybe the clerk. I previously asked uh, Assembly Research to look at the, the data gathering um, in, in terms of sport, and they weren't able to. So I think this is maybe more broadly something we could think about as a committee, whether we want to commission further research to, to inform our thinking. But you know, thank you very much. See you soon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, Mike. So I've now got Carl Nicole, and then I've got Paula. Hi, Yona. Thank you for your presentation. Um, and again, um, I mean, there's a there's a lot that what you said that you know I can certainly agree with. Um, but one of the comments you made, I just want to give you an opportunity to elaborate on it. And that's in relation to you can't put everything into Bill of Rights, but surely your argument would be that in relation to social and economic rights, um, that this. Certainly, this would need to happen, particularly in, in line with CEDA. And then the other thing I want to just pick your brain on, um, why you'll appreciate that we've got legislation here that protects women, for example, but you still have a lack of implementation. So would you see, certainly, um, you know, you use a recent example of the mother and baby, baby homes and the Magdalene laundries where a whole culture of misogynism and, you know, just not treating women and young girls very well. You know, we need to learn lessons and ensure within the Bill of Rights that things like that never happen again. So shut your thoughts on that. Yeah, th thank you very much. And yeah, when, when I said that uh, Bill of Rights, everything can't, can't go there, I meant in the sense that, you know, for example, C CEDO has 16 articles on everything from employment rights and overall legislative equality to healthcare provision. So you can't, uh, you wouldn't necessarily to put 
every single detail in it, but certainly the, the principles of, of that. And then that, in our view, would be that because the principles are in a Bill of Rights, that's how it would filter through to decision making across policy areas. It, it's definitely not saying that we would have this type of rights in a Bill of Rights, but not that type of rights, you know, we, we would view them as indivisible in that sense. No, um, that's Grant, Jana, because I was hoping it was in relation, I suspect it was probably in relation to CEDAW, um, but I just want to give the opportunity to put that in the record. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased with that. Thank you. Yeah. And again, I think a Bill of Rights with regard to the mother and baby homes and to, you know, that would absolutely agree that while, you know, I think in our paper we talked about, yeah, you, Euro versus de facto equality. So legislatively, the rights are there, but they are not being implemented in a number of ways for a number of reasons. And I think that's where, from a women's perspective, a Bill of Rights is, is critical. Because I said before that it's not about taking anybody's rights away, and it absolutely isn't, but it is a tool. And again, CEDAW bears this, uh, this out, and so do the other human rights treaties that where there is a gap, it's about taking action to eliminate that gap. So whether it's the gender pay gap, for for instance, you know, you know, to address address the pay gap between men and women, taking action to bring women's income up to the ben to that of men, or you know, would that's based specifically what the Bill of Rights should enable us. To do you know, the way we certainly that's not about taking rights away from men and nobody's saying that they men should earn less money it's about women bringing it up to the same level and again that that applies across the board the board of issues and i mean i think you know what when we look at, at some of the injustices that happened in the past that's yeah you know that's something that a bill of rights should set out to prevent it from happening again. Yeah, 100%. Yana, thank you. Okay, Paula. No, thank you very much. Thank you for coming to committee today. It was great to see you. I didn't realize you were so knowledgeable across all this detail. Um, I, I, I'm very um, conscious that um, it's a similar question I asked um, Robin, but it's in relation to the sort of pre-scrutiny, pre-legislated scrutiny tool that a Bill of Rights could um, provide us as legislators. Um, you know, we have two bills coming before us at the minute. We've got one, for example, I think Pat Catney's bringing one around period poverty, which in many ways um, will be, have a positive impact on socioeconomic um, issues and equality. And then there's another one that may have uh, sorry, will have um, probably unintended consequences in that it will um, widen the the, um, the gap between those people who can pick if the um, means and wealth to pay for services, while other people in marginalised communities may not. And I'm happy to go into further details at another Bill of Rights meeting around that. But to what degree would, would, would it matter really if a, a bill coming through would actually have a more negative impact on socioeconomic rights and um, the, the welfare of women? Um, would that have legal standing really? But um, if it was in a Bill of Rights, then it would, would um, actually uh, be problematic in terms of pa legislation passing. Does that make sense? So just to, just to check that I'm, I'm picking you up, Correctly, I'm good to see see you, Paula. So it's about whether it, where the standing of Bill of Rights, whether it, it should be come before other legislation, or you, well, you it's, would, almost, it's almost that legis pre legislative tool that we would have to benchmark everything against. That if we pass this legislation, it could have a positive impact in terms of. Um, equality for women, or it would have a negative impact on equality for women, and whether that would actually um, internationally be something that would generally be in a Bill of Rights. I think that, you know that that's part of what a Bill of Rights could be used to used for. I mean, I think you know CEDAW is broad enough because it, I mean, I like all the treaties. They are set fairly generic because they are intended to function in very different 
con context, but a Bill of Rights could provide that sort of check or almost like an incentive to ensure in when other legislation is being brought through that you can check against it to make sure that it's not having a negative context. So I don't want to compare it to uh, equality impact assessment in any way, but in as a equality impact assessment is obviously intended to provide that sort of check when check but and when implemented properly it, it can help make sure that services are provided equitably for everyone so you know it i would expect you know that the bill of rights could be used to flag up if there are potential problems on equality for on on any grounds you know and then that can be addressed using different mechanisms you know that either are in or follow from the bill of rights Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's probably, I suppose if I, if I gave all the details, it would probably make a lot more sense, but I suppose it's quite sensitive, the issues around it. Um, the other issue then is around the issue of gender-based violence, and I'm just thinking in particular around maybe some marginalised groups, maybe with within, um, disadvantaged areas or um, uh, ethnic minority or cultural, cultural um, groups. I'm just wondering to what degree a Bill of Rights could be more impactive than even just sort of domestic legislation, like the Domestic Abuse Bill, for example, just really, you know, how greater protection could be afforded in terms of that um, gender-based violence over and above um, uh, localised legislation. I think, it, it, again, I'm not an expert on gender, gender-based violence, and there will be other speakers, you know, who will have more detailed ex expertise on it, but a Bill of Rights could certainly so support provision, you know, to enhance provision that, that's currently there because it would formalize the rights of people of all backgrounds to to seek services. Because yes, I completely acknowledge that there's lots of additional barriers for for women, women from and people in general from more disadvantaged backgrounds and mi minority backgrounds to to seek services, but the way we would visualize a Bill of Rights is that it would state, it would integrate the principles that of elimination of discrimination on on basis of, of race and disability and so on. And I think, you know, there, there are other other ways of looking at minorities than just race, of course, I'm not saying, but that provides the principles that you can take action and again it's about you know if there is additional support needed for certain groups to access that service you know that's where a bill of rights could provide the basis for justifying additional support or so on okay thank you very much and i have got indication that mark wants to ask a question thanks chair uh thanks Yona. I was going to ask some stuff there on gender-based violence, but I appreciate Yona says it's not really her, her bailiwick, so I'll maybe forward them to the organisation, just, but thank you. But but there was one other one, maybe, and that's, like, we discussed last week about the higher proportion of people living here in Northern Ireland that have disabilities. And I was wondering, are there any particular challenges facing women in Northern Ireland? <laughs> As a result, uh, you know, maybe more caring responsibilities, would they generally fall to women? And I'm thinking particularly that in the context of, of us being a post-conflict society, of course. Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely, you know, and that's something that COVID has particularly borne out, that for a number of reasons, women in Northern Ireland tend to have even higher care burdens than, than women elsewhere. It, in the UK and Ireland, it's got to do with cultural perceptions uh, and many other things. And again, this is something that other speakers that will come following in the following weeks can probably be, give much more detail on. And that that's one of the critical area, areas. We, we think that the caring responsibilities prevent women from participating in 
labor market, for example, or yeah. in public life. And addressing that in a general sense is, is particularly important for gender equality and link to gender-based violence. Women with disabilities are particularly vulnerable because where they are victims of domestic abuse, they tend to be often dependent on their abusers. So there's particular challenges for them in, in being able to access access help and yeah. support. And while a bill of rights can't sort all of those issues out, but may, will help highlight those kind of issues and in hopefully help look at what at what can be done about those. Okay. Thanks, Shona. Okay, Mark. I don't think we have any other members indicating. So at this point, Jana, I thank you again for your presentation this afternoon and for um, answering all our questions and for taking the time out to, to join us at the committee. So um, I'll let you, you take your ease now, enjoy the rest of your day and thank you again. Thank you very much. And if there's any questions, just please come back to us. We will thank surely. You. Thanks a million. Members, we can now move on with the rest of our meeting pack. So um, we have agenda item four, which is chair's business, and we don't have any chair's business this week. Uh, item number five is uh, the draft minutes for our last meeting, last Thursday, 18th of February. You'll find them at page 21 of your pack if members are happy to agree the minutes. Yeah. Um, I'll Item number six is matters arising. We didn't have anything, but just following on from the question that Mike asked there, Mike, do you want the committee to commission a piece of research on the on the data collection around gender budget and, and uh, particularly with reference and we include there to to sport? I would imagine it would be a BFC committee. I'm, I'm thinking a bit broader, chair, in terms of. I mean, I know I know Dublin's ahead of us in terms of gender budgeting. Work. So, so maybe a uh, piece of work that, that would just, you know, inform us on best practice internationally in terms of gender budgeting, um, and, and maybe other gender issues, including CEDAW. I know, I know, Yona and I well have given us a breakdown, but I just think it would be nice to have a, an official assembly paper. I think we can do that, Clerk. Uh, yes, Chair, we can certainly commission that. Um, I just want to pick up, uh, Chair, and the members said other gender issues. Anything in particular in terms of other gender issues or just um, internationally or locally? Well, I think CEDAW and violence and gender budgeting. Okay. 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 Um, if, if, Chair, if members Never. agree, then certainly we can commission the paper. Yeah, don't see any dissent there. Okay, if we can move on then to correspondence, if members uh, are happy to note the correspondence that we have this week, we remember letters begin at page twenty, page thirty three of our packs. Yeah, and then our forward work program agenda number eight which begins at page 41 of the meeting pack. And agenda num number nine, any other business? If anyone has any other business they want to raise? I think maybe, Michelle, you're not muted. And with that, if nobody has any other business, we can go to the deep Okay. Close the meeting. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you. 29.